Whoa! Good guy, y'all. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. Wow! <laughs> yeah. World War II horror movies on this episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. Good guy, y'all. <laughs> I am your chill sergeant, Insane Mike. This is episode 228 of Attack Killer Podcast called World War II Horror. Over the next hour or two, you will go through the most intensive training of your life. I will run you until you puke, and then I'll run you even more. What you are in for with Attack of the Killer Podcast is a horror movie podcast where a group of friends get together, we pick a topic, and we discuss movies within that topic. There may be spoilers, son. Can you handle spoilers private? I can't hear you. Sir, yes, sir. That's right. You too can serve your country by signing up today and become an attacker. An attacker is the front line of defense. If you go to jointheattackers.com, you can pick the level that best suits you and get you all kinds of benefits for becoming part of the Killer Podcast Troop. You can get bonus episodes, monthly videos, video series is like Insane Mike's One Minute Top Ten List, and Killer Critiques. You can get a membership certificate and membership card, shirt, and even your own Mikey's Monsters, which is a portrait of you as a monster of my choice. Do I make myself clear? Go to joinattackers.com, pick the tier that best suits you, and remember, Uncle Sam Haim wants you to be an attacker today. <laughs> And now, here's my company, the most ragtag group of soldiers you've ever met. It's time to introduce you to the podcast crew. He was personally responsible for 40 downed enemy planes, making him the worst mechanic we've ever seen. Sergeant Tad. (laughs) Uh, Sir, yes, sir. I don't know. His helmet has rear view mirrors on it. That way he could see the front line. Bomb expert, Private Jason. (laughs) Hey, everybody. Uh, Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I need to use the latrine. Next in our platoon, he is in charge of bringing the chips. Corporal Andy. (laughs) Running jokes. I like it. (laughs) Moorash, Moorash, Semper Fi. And lastly, our special guest, he was in charge of training dogs to work on submarines. He calls them subwoofers. Don and Ellie. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> You've broken him. <laughs> oh, that's classic. <laughs> Don, uh, hey, hey, you're hey, back, Don, buddy. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> For now. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't make any more mentions of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining uh, us, Don. It's, it's good to have you back on the uh, show, man. Been a long uh, time. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, it's been so long, I haven't even formally met Andy yet, so <laughs> nice to finally work with you. Yeah, glad to have you, man. Why don't you tell the listeners, well, and Andy, uh, a little <laughs> bit about yourself <laughs> and what you do, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, basically, I'm just one of the biggest cheerleaders in the community. Um, Word. Yeah, horror community. Uh, I do uh, several podcasts. I do uh, writing, uh, movie reviews, interviews, that sort of thing for several different websites. And, and in between all that, trying to, you know, keep myself sane, healthy, and uh, just watch as much as I can and support what I can. Awesome. Well, we're going to have some fun on this episode, I believe. Now, <clears throat> back in character. <laughs> now, Tad is going to lead the troop on a new secret mission. That's called What We Watched. All right. 
Welcome to what we watched. I'm going to cheat this week and go straight into what I watched because uh, I'm excited. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, I, I don't do this very this, often, yeah. but uh, I'm. I didn't watch much. Like I think the last couple times I might have led in what we watched. Uh, this this time it is not the case. But what I watched, I really liked. So. Uh, first, I will say I watched Psycho Goreman, like I assume. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Andy did. I know Jason did. Did you get to watch yep. it, Mike? No, I have did, not. Uh, how about you, Don? Uh, it's been on my list. Um, it sh- should be one of the first things I watch as soon as I can get some time to it. Excellent. So uh, I'm sure our listeners sort of know a little bit about it. I'm not going to spoil anything because it's so new, but... Uh, I freaking loved it. It was so uh, drenched in humor, but also blood and guts. It was like a kid's like Power Rangers movie with uh, gore and swearing <laughs> and uh, just really weird humor. The interactions between the family members are so strange and perfectly hilarious, but I really, really loved it. I recommend checking it out. I think uh, I, I watch it for like, I think it was like six bucks on Amazon Prime, but um, you can watch it through Alamo Draft House or Screen Lane Armor. Uh, many theaters, indie theaters are offering uh, rentals. So uh, if you want to support one of them, do that. I just want to tell Mike, like, it's basically an a new Astron 6 movie. Oh, wow. Yes. Basically. I mean, an Adam it's not Brooks. It's really is in, an Astron 6 movie, but it's in. Right. Adam Brooks from them oh. is in it. Yeah. The guy with the mustache who's the lead yeah. a lot of times and he's okay crazy funny sorry i just wanted to no no it is it has a connection to the them sense and of humor it's very too. in that uh tone yeah the really off off the wall sense of humor is absolutely there um it's a movie that shouldn't work but it does <laughs> uh i finished the uh night stalker on netflix about mm-hmm. uh, richard ramirez which was really good i think it was only like four or five episodes which felt really short and sort of ended abruptly but um Learned a lot about old Richard Ramirez. I didn't know or necessarily want to know. Uh, very it's, well done. It can though. be a tough. It can be a tough watch at some points. It's it's disturbing. Yeah. And then uh, the third thing I watched was on HBO Max. It was the Little Things. Um, mm-hmm. What a cast on that! I uh, it's getting a lot of hate. I don't get it. Uh, really? Maybe I just like everything but it's getting a lot of people are saying it's boring they didn't like the ending or um i thought it was awesome uh rami malik is so fucking good in it uh we got denzel and we got jared leto uh reminding everyone that he's awesome because i think uh people also like to hate on him too and it is unwarranted that dude is a stellar actor in this movie he fucking kills it so uh i i think i've seen some people claim that it's like a waste of their talents because they don't like the writing. I don't know. I thought everybody uh, had such a distinct character. It just, it was awesome. I loved it. Uh, Check it out. It's on HBO max and in theaters. If you feel like uh, catching COVID and that's what I watched. (laughs) Uh, Let's go to Andy. What have you watched? Um, I, I watched about uh, three or four that I wanted to talk about. I, of course, uh, as you mentioned before, I did watch Psycho Goreman, and the way that I'm going to describe it, uh, uh, Tad took part of it, but I'll put it to you like this. Think if the cast of uh, Wishmaster and the cast of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers took a hit of Mushrooms <laughs> and then made like a kid's sing-along tape, and that's basically... <laughs> Pretty good. I think that's a safe <laughs> assumption of what yeah. what you're getting into, and it's just a, it's a hell of a lot of fun. Um, I also uh, watched uh, Hunted on uh, Shutter, oh, which yeah. uh, I I really enjoyed that one too. Um, and I'm in concurrence with Tad. It's 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 a it's, it's it's like Revenge, but it's to me this is just a lot more. Uh, I guess the word primal comes up because there, she reaches a point where she's just so sick of this fucker and his bullshit and she just loses it. And, um, I had to laugh because there's a point in it where it, she, she, she starts, it starts to remind me of Braveheart and I couldn't help but start laughing. <laughs> uh, uh, don't but, worry. You're not the only one. I thought that you're not the only one. I thought that too. 
Yeah, um, but it 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 doesn't it doesn't ruin the movie because the movie the movie is stellar and I definitely recommend it. Um, one that really kind of uh, the premise to it really really interested me, but it just it uh, it I felt like it could have done a lot more. It's a movie called Wild Boar, and it's basically about these geocache hunters. And they have to go into this place called the Forbidden Zone, where there's a lot of radiation in there. But it's the geocache is was was put there by this really really wealthy guy, and they don't know what it is. And it could be a hell of a lot of money, and it could be nothing. But they're they live for this kind of stuff. They they go to go hunting for this these geocache finds. But what they stumble on is like this weird. Uh, community of cannibalistic uh pig people that are trying to eat them it's like a cross between like the island of dr moreau and wrong turn and with like a little bit of apocalyptic like mad max thrown in and that's what really attracted me to it but uh i mean it's worth one watch but i mean i wish they could have done more with it i mean i think it felt i think it felt kind of flat um, the last one I want to talk about is a movie called Triggered, and it's about these all these high school students that are harboring, you know, uh, this this bad secret that happened back in they were they were in high school. But it's kind of like a re- little bit of a re- of reunion. They're all in their early twenties, and th- all of them uh, are in the out there partying in the woods and whatnot. And they all wake up with bombs strapped to their chest that they cannot get off. And the premise is, um, each of them has um, a timer on on their chest, and they all have different times. But what they discover is, if they start killing each other, and if they're within the the proximity of the person that they kill, they gain that time. So. Oh. Yeah, it's it's really kind of a cool premise, but if they don't kill anybody and their timer runs out, their bomb goes off. So there's only going to be one person left, and it's kind of one of those you find out who your friends are situations. So yeah, uh, it's 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 a really really unique uh, n- unique movie, and I I suggest that one as well. It's it's pretty cool, but yeah, that's what I watched. All right. Uh, We'll just jump over to Don. What have you seen recently? Okay. um, For me, uh, the one major film that I saw is uh, one that, for those of you that know me, will know that the second I saw that this was available, I came instantly. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. It's a film called Killer Shark. Uh Uh-huh. And essentially, it's China's answer to the reef. Uh, exact same setup, exact same premise, exact same uh, scenario. A group of dipshits head out into the water, get into a boat accident, and are killed off one by one with by a giant shark as they try to swim to shore. Like I said, it's the reef. But I will say this. The shark is a lot more vicious and brutal in this one. The attacks are far bloodier than than what what we got on the reef. Uh, it's pretty suspenseful. It's a really, really tight film. It's only 72 minutes long, so it's it doesn't drag that much. It in and out, you know, you're right there with it. Um, not necessarily a lot I like in the finale. It kind of rushes things through. It kind of ham fists this environmentally sound message that doesn't go with the rest of the film. But other than that, uh, Really fun. I kind of liked it. Uh, craptacular CGI as expected, but <laughs> I can look at that. Love that. Oh, oh for sure. Indeed, I do. Um, <laughs> as well, I also managed to catch a uh, couple of films for uh, screeners. Uh, um, caught a film called I Am Lisa, which uh, should be coming out pretty soon. Um, I know the director on Facebook, and uh, he gave me a screener to watch. Uh, basically, it's about a uh, woman in a small town. She's, you know, abused and bullied and picked on and so forth. 
And she goes to complain to the local sheriff about it, who turns out to be the mother of the vic- the person that's bullying her. So she gets bullied and beaten down even further. She gets left in the woods and is bitten by a wolf and somehow acquires werewolf powers. Hmm. Now, she doesn't turn into a complete werewolf. She just turns into, you know, she gets crazy eyes. She gets, like, fangs and wolf claws, like, for hands. But she goes out and she sets out to seek revenge on them one by one. So uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, don't go into this expecting anything major. There's no transformations whatsoever. Mm. Um, but it, it's really fun. Uh, like I said, the revenge quotient for this is pretty enjoyable. Uh, some may have an uh, issue with how far the bullying goes because some of it is just unrealistic to the point of getting the movie going instead of being realistic in any kind of a sense. But if you're fine with that, if you're fine with like, you know, 15 to $20,000 budget, if that, because it looked a lot cheaper, actually, I'm just guessing. But if you're fine with those kinds of films, you can do a lot worse than that. I had, I enjoyed it and I had fun with it. The Patrick Ray film. And, right? Oh yeah. From Kansas right. Yeah. City. That's him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 He, I um, know that guy. like I said, I've, yeah, I've, uh, been friends with him for a while on Facebook. Um, reviewed Ooh. a couple of his films yeah. and shorts. So nice guy. Yeah, he gave I'm me the uh... cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He gave me a screener for the film. So mm-hmm. yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. And uh, other film I got to watch was uh, Ten Minutes to Midnight, the uh, new one with Caroline Williams. Oh yeah, that poster looks crazy awesome. Yeah. Um. So is that basically, it's a Bronson start... film. No, that's ten to midnight. Yeah, okay, sorry, confused <laughs> me there for a second. Yeah, um, that's actually the first time we've heard that. Um, I've actually been comparing it to the Iron Maiden song t- Two Minutes to Midnight." <laughs> I actually called it that a couple of times, and I caught myself. But yeah, um, so basically, Caroline plays a radio DJ who's coming into work uh, with a strange set of marks on her neck. Um, basically dripping blood like crazy, but deciding, you know, show must go on. And come to find out, her replacement is banging her boss, who she used to have a romantic relationship with. That got her the job in the first place, and things go from there. Um, I, have you, any of you guys seen it? Because I don't know how spoilerific I want to get with this. I have not. I have not nope. seen it. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the case. I'm <laughs> not going to go too spoilerific with it. Um, if you want to hear a fantastic podcast with me on it, um, it is on uh, Fresh Cuts. Um, it's a sideshow for another podcast called No More Room in Hell. Um, I'll explain all that in my links to, later on. But uh, yeah, it, it's worth a watch. Not necessarily top 10 of the year, but. You can do a lot worse than that. That's Caroline. You got to check it out. Absolutely. And yeah, um, for those of you wondering, uh, more than one, okay, uh, more than one reference to um, Stretch. So, ah. uh, <laughs> yeah, more than one reference to that. So, uh, for those of you wondering, but uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I watched. Excellent. I forgot to mention one other little thing I watched. Um, it's not actually. A full movie, but I saw a rough teaser trailer for a new horror movie called Miracle Valley, um, written and directed by The Room's Greg Sestero. Oh, and nice. you guys are going to be like blown away by this trailer because uh, if you're used to The Room, um, this is not The Room. And he's been wanting to make a horror movie for quite some time. And he went out in the desert in Arizona last year and made one right before everything got shut down and so he's been editing and um yeah it looks freaking awesome so something to look forward to uh jason what have you watched well i finally got to watch sound of metal holy crap that movie is awesome yeah and how big of a bummer was that for you like, it's a right? huge bummer oh man it's the worst i mean it's it's awesome because it's a music movie a band movie and it's the band stuff's great, and it's just so dang sad that it just 
And as an audio guy, and I do plenty of audio work and do audio mixing for movies, like that part was really fun to listen to too, just how they portrayed a person, you know, because you can't just go pure silent. And I, just how they handled all of him losing his hearing was great and how it sounded after he tried to fix it. And, oh, what a, just a great, sad, sad-ass story. <laughs> I heard some criticism from people who were saying that the people at the deaf community um, oh, were speaking come on. too too clearly to be deaf. I I th- I, th- I thought that too, but like in my head, I was like, they both the the main the guy of the house and like he explained he uh, wasn't born deaf, so right. So he learned he, to speak before, yeah, yeah, and so and same with the guy, like. Yes, it would change, but he's pretty much talked the way he did. I, I wondered if there'd be some criticism, but I thought it was easy to just let it go. But and they and Olivia Cook is the girlfriend, right? Yep. Uh huh. She, oh, she is so fucking Motel. Oh, she's she is she is incredible in everything. I think. Uh, but like, she's she, gonna she's she gonna win an Oscar eventually. Uh, oh yeah, she, yeah. She doesn't even look like her for the first half of the movie. It's right. No eyebrows. Oh man, it was crazy. Yeah, she was awesome. It was awesome. Great movie. It's on Prime. Everyone should watch it. Um, I saw Midnight Sky. I watched that. George Clooney's new movie on Netflix. Um, it's Mike would hate it, but it's not just a slow, spacey type movie. But you might like it. It's good. But just yeah, just this lone scientist guy. The world is pretty much ended, and he's everyone's taken off. And the left the planet, and he's kind of left there, and some. And it, yeah, it's it's pretty good. I, I I mean, of course, I liked it because I like everything, but um, it was really pretty and great sound and and score and Clooney was great in it and directing, and I liked it a lot. That's good. Um, I also saw Psycho Gorman and the little things, but then I also. Just last night, Tina and I watched Promising Young Woman. Oh, Holy man. crap, that movie is awesome. Yeah. Good Lord, it was awesome. Now, I, I know you've seen it, but, like, I guess I, it's not that I'm complaining, but it felt like I was mis, maybe I wasn't misled, but it, I insinuated too much from the trailer that she was killing the people, but she, I don't know, maybe that's, I don't know if it's a spoiler or not too bad, but she wasn't really killing the men, but, um, yeah, Carrie Mulligan, she was awesome. It's got Bo Burnham in such a great role. He's so funny. Got Mike's other girlfriend, Allison Brie, Clancy Brown. Oh, man, it's so good. Definitely right. Yeah, I, d- I didn't even watch trailers or read about it. I just heard that it was, you know, through the grapevine, everybody's saying, mm-hmm. uh, is really, really good. And so I avoided reading anything, just went right into it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it was a revenge film. I didn't know anything about it and blew me out of the water. Yeah, man, it's freaking awesome. So that's what I watched. All right. That leaves you, Mikey. What have you watched? Uh, well, I also watched the hunted. That was awesome. Um, I think I have one episode left of night stalker. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to really watch a whole lot. Uh, so the one I want to talk about is, um, a movie called Giuseppe makes a movie. It's a documentary directed by Adam Rifkin, uh, that I found late one night on prime. Um, and I've been wanting to see it, uh, for two reasons to try to better understand, uh, the films made by Giuseppe Andrews, Mm -hmm. but mostly I wanted to check it off my, um, Adam Rifkin uh, checklist. Uh, m- mostly a fan of his films, but trying to see more of his films. Um, so this makes like now the eighth film of his that I've seen. Uh, for those who don't know who Giuseppe Andrews is, he is an actor. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And Jason's not a fan at all. No. Um, he's been in such films as Independence Day, Detroit Rock City, Cabin Fever, Never Been Kissed, American History X, Cabin Fever Two. Um, <clears throat> and he and surprisingly, when I was I was kind of looking him up, 
uh, while watching it. He has worked steadily as an actor ever since 1993. Like he has not had, um, you know, very much off time as an actor, which is cool. Um, and even with all that work, he decides he just wants, he lives in this trailer park. Um, and his big passion nowadays is making his own movies for very little or next to no money at all. Um, and he, he cast his movies with local homeless people. So the documentary follows Giuseppe around as he's making his latest film, Garbanzo Gas, that he plans on making in two days with a thousand dollar budget. And, you know, and it's, <clears throat> as, as an Adam Rifkin movie, you know, I'm not overly impressed. It basically just, it just literally follows Giuseppe and his friends around while they make this movie. And, um, just kind of behind the scenes of shooting it. And the quality of it is about the quality of a Giuseppe Zandrews movie. So it's pretty low quality. Um, and I don't, I do not still get any more insight on the mind of Giuseppe Andrews. I just don't get it. I don't get his films. I don't get what he's trying to do. I don't, I don't understand his art at all. And it's a bummer because unlike Jason, I, I like this. I like it when I see him show up in things and, and he's done a lot of stuff for Adam Rifkin. You know, he was in Detroit rock city. Uh, he was in um, stoned aged. Um, I think he was in a couple other of his movies, but uh so you know, I don't mind seeing Giuseppe show up and things. Like now, I, I kind of dig him, but yeah, help, I, help me out here. Uh, um, I do remember something Giuseppe Andrews did, and it was like it was so damn bizarre, but yet it—I mean, it was hilarious. But it was like this old man standing in front of a mirror, and he's—I think he's naked. And he's talking about pork rinds, and he says it's like <laughs> fried fried pig pussy or some shit. I was like, yeah. I, what was the name of that? Oh, what was dude. that even? I don't know. He's made probably around twenty of his own movies, and I couldn't even begin to tell you the names of any of them. And they all they all just kind of seem the same to me. They're all shot in the same place, or in and around this trailer park, or some hotel rooms or whatever they use his trailer for most of most of the filming of of his movies and they always star the same you know six or seven homeless people that cannot act and it's not even like it's not even like enjoyably bad and strange and weird like uh say like greasy strangler it's just it's just bad because i don't i don't think harmony corinne could get stoned enough to write something like that that's just <laughs> like yeah that was it, just bizarre yeah well he like it, he says in this documentary you know this new movie that he's making which is called garbanzo gas he came up with the title because he ate some garbanzo beans and then farted and decided that was going to be the name of his movie so that gives you an idea of the level of what we're dealing with here Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a part of me I know you love it and respect that and a little, it's a little bit close to home, you know, not yeah, the way you come up with movie titles, but <laughs> you know, just a guy trying to make movies with his friends slash homeless people. But you know, like I do a little bit budget. and on and on a level I enjoyed the doc on the level of seeing a guy make his vision um yeah. the way he wants to make his vision, you know. But I just don't get that vision, and then I don't, I don't, I don't get anything out of that vision. So it's not really it for me. Possible he's just lost his mind. It's tough to say, man. I just don't no, know. It's, well, whatever his vision is, I'm pretty sure his eyes are bloodshot. I can't remember the actor's name. Pupils but, dilated. I can't remember the actor's name, but he also shows up in a lot of Adam Rifkin movies, and apparently he's friends with Giuseppe. You know, he's a he's an actual actor. Who Giuseppe gave him two hundred dollars to come? No, maybe it was three hundred dollars to come play a part in this in this Garbanzo gas movie. And we're talking like they're wearing the worst store bought. Every character is wearing the worst store bought wigs ever, and don't know how to put on a wig. Um, and Giuseppe yeah, passively aggressively talks this man into snorting flour for a scene, pretending it's cocaine. And you can see the moment where they're getting ready to shoot another shot, and the guy's just laying on the bed. He's like, I'm going to need a minute. I should not have snorted that flower. And 
Yeah, it's it's just it's bizarre. It's not as gross as you think it is, Jason, because Jason and I are a little bit familiar with uh, some of Giuseppe's work because um, some of his earlier stuff he would submit to Troma Dance, and we've seen some of his stuff show up on like the Best of Troma Dance DVDs, oh. and Troma even put out um, one of his films, Trailer Park something, I forget the name of it, and we've watched like the trailer for it, and you know, it's got scenes of like this old man having sex with his own feces and it's just what the really <laughs> sick and messed up stuff. But it doesn't this nothing in the documentary goes to that level of grossness or anything, but it's still just very, you know, old men with scraggly beards who so can barely speak the words, let alone try to act. Where's them. the line between him and don't be mad at me, I'm just a John Waters type. Well, it's interesting because when right. I looked up the film on on IMDb, they they you know um, speaking of feces, they they made there was made references to John Waters, and uh, I don't know. I think because everything you said about this guy in his movies on paper, I would assume you love it, so it must be really bad. Well, qual- right. first of all, quality is a million times better in a John Waters movie, even yeah. though those movies were made you know, 30, 40 years ago in comparison. But, and, and John Waters, even though he worked with next to nothing as well, still tried to craft the best (laughs) thing that he could. Giuseppe feels like he's more, I mean, his ambition for this film was to shoot it in two days. It's a 74 minute movie. Garbanzo gas is, and he went out to purposely make it within two days. So, you know, that means just a lot of like, it's all about, it's all about, quantity and not quality and i feel like that's definitely reversed with john waters um and plus like you could say what you want about the john waters um cast that are in those movies but there is a a level of performances in those that is entertaining and i cannot find anything entertaining about you know some of these homeless men yeah Yeah, he's because he's literally like when he he rolls the camera and he holding the camera reads off the line for the old for the old homeless man to say back to him into the camera and that is the level of performance you get yeah if rifkin can't save it it, it must just be bad <laughs> yeah and see and That's this too bad. and this whole this whole experiment with me about adam rifkin is really i don't know trying to trying to get more of an eye of his vision and if his vision falls into <laughs> what i enjoy because I love Detroit Rock City. I love The Dark Backwards. That movie's awesome. I love it. I love The Chase. His segment in Chillerama was great. Um, but then he did like, you know, one of his earlier films was Invisible, Invisible Maniac. And then he also did like Stone Age. And I'm kind of eh on that one. Um, I like the Stone Age. It was it was okay. I, now, it, be warned, there's two different movies called Stone Age. Um this one was put out by National Lampoon, and it was originally called Homo Erectus. But okay, it was released good. on DVD as Stoned Age. So basically, it's an Anna Rifkin is the star in it, and basically he's this caveman trying to become yeah. more evolved. I'm thinking about a completely different movie. <laughs> and probably one of my favorite movies of the past decade, man, has been um, Director's Cut with, uh, yeah. with Penn. That movie is freaking awesome. So I'm I'm just I'm really I'm still trying to uh you Get know finger on it. I just don't want to be like, oh, I'm such an Adam Rifkin fan when I've only seen eight of his movies, you know. And now like three of those I'm not that <laughs> not, not that fond of. So Yeah. But anyway, that's what I watched. Excellent. Uh nice uh slate of movies we watched. That's right. So, and speaking of movies, if you want to see some of the best in horror, you need to sign up for Shudder. Shudder is the sponsor of Attack of the Killer podcast. And if you have not gotten Shudder yet, you need to. It's the Netflix of horror. It's freaking awesome. They do a lot of really awesome, cool, original content. Um, you know, they got that. I love the Creep Show series. Anything, any of the Joe Bob, Joe Bob episodes are amazing. So you need to get on Shudder. If you're still not convinced, here you go. This is a gift from us. You get a free month for free. You get a free month, and you get a free month, and you get a free month of Shutter. So uh, to to get that free month, just put in the promo code 
AOTKP and get your first month of Shutter for free. You're not going to regret it. You're going to become a subscriber instantly, I promise. Okay, so now... Oh, gotta get back in character. <laughs> Private Jason has returned with some intel that may help us win this war! And he calls that intel pole position. From now on, like your parents were, you are the secret force of pole position. All right. Hey, everybody. So with some sweet feedback, I believe it was Brian Clark, but I just to recap last episode's pole position. The question was then what, you know, which serial killer do you find most interesting? And Jason and Andy tied. Oh, so we're the winners. Uh, what were the we, answers? We had Jeffrey Dahmer from me and John Wayne Gacy from Andy. Where did, where was I? You and Ted tied for second. Okay. Yep. Or okay. last. Like, <laughs> or last. If you're not first, you're last. That's right. Ed, Ed Ed Gein Gein and Albert should have been number one. Well, you know, if you'd figure your Twitter out, you could have went and voted and <laughs> got yourself up a little higher. But that was last week. So um, this week, this episode, the question is, what's your favorite war horror movie? And Insane Mike, you're first. I'm going to go with Dog Soldiers. One of the, oh. Not only one of the best war horror movies ever, but probably one of the best werewolf movies ever. It's true. Never yeah. seen it. Oh, Ted, really? let's oh, get nice. that on the show. Cool. I've owned it for about ten years, but <laughs> never seen it. It's damn good. There's a there's a uh, first time episode. Yep. Yeah. All right. I'll go next. Uh, my favorite, and it always has been. I've loved this movie since it came out because it got me and it fucked me up hard. And it's Jacob's Ladder. Ooh, yeah, that is a really good pick. I kind of forgot about that. What one. a mind fuck that movie was. I love it. Tim Robbins. Man, it's good. Did they ever come out with that remake? That came out, right? Yes, it did. Yep. And mm -hmm. I have not. Yeah, I saw it. when it, I saw it when it came out. Any good? Did you like it, Don? That silence should speak volumes. Okay, got it. I, <laughs> I was, didn't know if you cut out was, or that was okay. <laughs> no, yeah, that was uh, the crickets in. Yeah, okay. He, he was taught if that you don't purpose. have anything nice to say, don't say anything That's at all. That's right. That's where you need to put the crickets chirping. Got it. Oh, Dang it, man. I was late. <laughs> Missed it. All right, Ted, you're next. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I guess this counts, but, uh, I had sort of a hard time picking one cause I'm looking through this list and I sort of like the ones on our episode coming up, but yeah. I went with predator. Ooh, it's a weird good one. that Andy didn't pick that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I figured that that's more of like a, con it has something to do with like a conv conflict and not like an actual war, but I, but yeah, it know. shows up on a lot of lists and that's a good one. And Andy, what's your pick then? My pick is, and it almost isn't a war movie per se, but because it it's it has reanimated soldiers that come back, and so it doesn't take place during the war. But screw it, I'm saying it anyway. It's dead <laughs> dead snow. Yeah, can't go wrong with some uh, Nazi zombies. I'll be honest, I like part two better, but that's just me. Yeah. Part two, yeah, I might agree with that. It's I mean, it's a it was a little too slapsticky for me. I kind of like the first one a little bit better. I wish they'd do a third because I feel like Dead yeah. Snow was was like the Evil Dead of Nazi zombie movies, <laughs> and then yeah. Dead yeah. Snow Two was the Evil Dead Two yep. of Nazi zombie movies. So yeah, we need the Army of Darkness Nazi zombie movies. Well, those are all some really good picks, Don. I'm afraid that Twitter only lets us have four choices, but if you got to pick, what would your favorite war horror movie be? Well, considering it's number 11 on my all-time genre list, I would say Dog Soldiers. Yeah. But, so there's a vote for me already. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, if I were to nominate a new choice, um, I would say The Keep. Keep. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Uh, Ian McKellen. Uh. Mm -hmm. Now, if they made werewolf women of the SS, that <laughs> might really actually change Dude, my that, whole pick here. <laughs> that would definitely, that would definitely alter things. Yes, that brings up. That would, a, that, that, I will agree. That definitely alters things. <laughs> that brings up a, a small discussion we don't have time for. But like, do 
do like the Nazi exploitation movies fall into horror, like Elsa movies and stuff like that. Hell Camp of the SS. Uh, I cover them on my site because I specifically labeled it horror and exploitation. Yeah. Um, I consider it close enough to be a genre worth looking at, but I'm totally yeah. comfortable if people are unwilling to cross the the boundary into that subject matter. So, sure, yeah, that's how I feel so too. Would that yeah. disqualify harem keeper of the oil sheiks. <laughs> with the sequel count. Well, anyway, that's a uh, poll position for today. Get your butts over to Twitter at aotkp. Get your Twitter's working and get your votes in for dog soldiers or whatever you want to pick, but dog soldiers I might can actually win one of these, but anyway, it'd be about time. <laughs> That's a uh, poll position. All right. So now we need to finally get into the topic at hand. So yeah, um, I think to go along with poll position, it's kind of tough to, there isn't like a ton of war related horror movies. I think probably because the topic of war is, horrific enough you know to throw in another horror element almost yeah doesn't any seem like war, it would work any war movie is a horror movie yeah kind of yeah. right so mm. kind, i mean yeah violence well, wise can Patton. be yeah maybe not that one Patton, i don't i don't know if that would count yeah maybe Taps. Not. <laughs> anyways and so is. chad what's our first movie tonight <laughs> our first movie is Overlord. Three months ago, I was cutting grass in my front yard. The mailman shows up with a letter from the army. Now I'm here. No idea where I'm going to end up. Welcome to France. What happened here? Some questions aren't good answers. There's a lot of soldiers out there, and there's only four of us. Find out what's inside that compound. Release November 9th, 2018 here in the U.S., directed by Julius Avery. Um, this one is freaking awesome. I saw it in theaters. Uh, I'll go over a brief synopsis. A small group of American soldiers uh, find horror behind enemy lines on the eve of D-Day. So, basically, the soldiers are flying in a plane. The Nazis shoot them down and kill most of the uh, paratroopers. And there's four of them left. They take refuge in a French woman's house who is helping them uh, sort of hide out until they can get in and destroy a radio tower built uh, in a castle in an old French town. Uh, so 
they have to figure out a way in, and when they do, they discover there's a lot more shit going on, including reanimating corpses and keeping um, corpses alive. Yeah, this one, like I said, I, I got to see it in theaters. Uh, the trailers, if you haven't seen this one, guys, don't even try watching that trailer. Uh, I think the whatever ACDC or whatever it plays in it <laughs> is a horrible choice because this movie's so much better than that and deserves yeah. so much better than ACDC. Um, just the opening, like, 15 minutes, holy fuck. Is there a better oh opening to a movie? Uh, right. And the whole sequence just, oh, my goodness. Yeah, when I got my new TV, this is the first movie I put on because <laughs> oh, awesome. I wanted to see it with, like, the surround sound and uh, in 4K and holy shit, man. Like, the sound, the visuals, this Beautiful. movie just, yeah, kicks off uh, right in the balls. Like, just, man, uh, pedal to the floor, no stopping. It's, and it's this so movie tense. Just right. Yeah, you're but way, yeah, you're yeah, way lucky for getting to see this in the theater because that had to have been intense as hell and. Uh, that whole, especially when he's like falling from the sky, I would have been yarking and yeah, going ass over elbows just all the way down. Just yeah, this one's awesome. What do you guys think? I love this damn movie. Uh, <laughs> this, I mean, I, I, I love the, I love the characters because uh, anytime I can see bits and pieces of myself. In every one of the characters, just just traits, you know, because I was I was looking at it, I was just like, in time in time of war, if I was there, I would totally want to be like Ford because that's the guy that you know is going to get out alive. Humanitarian wise, I would want to be like Boyce, but and then as I'm looking back in reality, I got a feeling that I'd probably be more like Tibbets, you know. Just very, very cynical. I mean, I would do what that need to be done, but, you know, I wouldn't, you know, want that kid around me. I wouldn't want any of that shit. But, I mean, when push comes <laughs> to shove, I try to do the right try to do the right thing. You know? I thought you were um, just trying to compare yourself to a Russell because we got Wyatt Russell in here and obviously uh-huh. get a lot of uh, Kurt Russell vibes from him. Oh, yeah. Um, he's, you know, I think they, they were considering casting him in the remake of Escape from New York, weren't they? Whoa. I think fans wanted it, but I don't think he was ever <laughs> oh, considered. But he's fantastic. Um, and, yeah, I think oh. that was. I think that was the rumor was that it was just a fan thing. Oh, um, just the and and the effects. You know, it's just like it's such great stuff. And like I said, it's it's always tense. You know, because they're always on the, whether they're in the complex that they're trying to bring down, or whether in the, when they're in the French woman's house. There's always so much tension there because they're just on the – it could be a millisecond and they're caught. And um, – Yeah, Chloe, it, Chloe's badass too. Oh, yeah, yeah. she's awesome. Um, and, you know, that chick with – that chick with the flamethrower. Yeah, yeah, Chloe with the flamethrower. <laughs> awesome. Um, the effects in the uh, – in the complex and just, you know, chase saying his head hurts. And then he just headbutts oh. that freaking se- that beam and just <laughs> cracks it. Just like, Jesus. Um, yes, folks watch this movie, watch this goddamn movie. It's good. What I love about it is that they play it straight. There's, I mean, it obviously has a crazy fantastical ending, but like for all intents and purposes, it's a straight on war movie that you're trying to figure out and get to the end of and it and then it's just gory as hell. Just every damn kill and thing is it's fucking crazy. <laughs> so intense. Yeah, like a sim- one simple head gunshot is like a massive spray of oh. blood. But not like a geyser sp- you know, it's like a this like huge misty spray of blood, which you would imagine what it would look like. And they're they're so, yeah. they're such a band of brothers, and the way they talk, they they kind of flip each other shit, you know. Just it, while they're riding in the plane, I just thought I just kind of thought that was funny, and just it you know it, they have a certain camaraderie where you know you wouldn't let anybody else screw with you like that, but you know they you know that they're your buddies and. Of course, the uh, Bokeem uh, Woodbine uh, Renzen. Uh, I think that that's the sergeant that's just you know kept keeps calling them ladies, you know, and yeah, I thought he was great for what little time he was in it. 
Yeah, I don't have uh, much else but compliments for this thing. I, uh, I, this, I should mention all three are first time watches. Ooh, mm, oh, right. wow. Yeah. Um, I actually kind of got hoodwinked by the asylum on this one. I thought I had seen it, only to discover I had actually seen a film called Nazi Overlord. Oh, uh, no. uh, <laughs> Damn you, asylum. <laughs> I'm usually better at that, but yeah, they got me on that one. F- for once um i have nothing but compliments for this i'm completely on board with you guys um perhaps a bit lighter on the horror than i anticipated i figured the mutants and the uh yeah. i figured those would be a little bit more prominent in the film but i'm totally on board with the action war throughout here um like you said the brotherhood is completely believable engaging and I absolutely loved all four of them. They're just a completely enjoyable group to be around, and that definitely helps. Um, stunt work is off the charts. I mean, the oh. scenes in here are fantastic. The, I mean, like you said, jumping into the water, trying to survive, and getting out of the parachutes underwater. Just fantastic stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm completely in agreement with this. I don't have much else but compliments for this thing just like you guys are don mentioned it for me um my my probably the one thing and it's not to take anything away from the movie but the horror part um and it was way less than i thought it was going to be and it really to me it really wasn't that horrific and i think that just has to do with like again what i said at the top of this topic of this is a uh tough topic to try to throw in a horror element and some kind of supernatural horror element yeah. into it. And for that to be scary when the, when the well, whole act of war itself is scary in and of itself. Well, the main thing why I would say that is that the main horror element for me, and I would say that this would probably be spoilers for those of you that aren't, you know, for that sort of thing is the introduction of the elixir. I think that's yeah. really the only true oh, horror yeah. you get in the film. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, you see what happens to them when they do. And that's, you know, you sort of turn into the unkillable, deformed monstrosities. But that's not really explored much because it's introduced so late into the film. It's, what, over an hour before they realize, before he comes back from the mission and he brings yeah. the mm-hmm. syringe with them, isn't it? Yeah. yeah because that's okay. when the first, that's like the. Yeah, it's like the first hour into the film where they finally yeah. bring that syringe with the elixir back. And that's when you, they first start realizing, oh my god, there's more going on here. Because the rest of the film is, like you said, the you know journey to the village, the meeting up with uh, the woman, and then staying in her house. Like, it's not much of a horror film, even though it's entertaining as all hell. And it's really kind of just spurts of it with that, that elixir until the end when you finally get to see them, you know, the Wehrmacht and all of their deformed glory coming out after them. Like, that's really where it starts becoming horror. But even still, you've got all of the shootouts in the village around them. So it's, you know, much more of an action war film with just a few bits and pieces of horror. Yeah. Yeah, you've got... Not that I... Yeah. Yeah, it's not a complete... Oh, go ahead. I was, I was just saying you've got you've got elements of of horror with um just the the experiments with like the talking uh spinal cord head and Ugh. you know they they threw uh-huh. they threw right. all that in there and you know what whatever was in that that bag you know that 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 poor you know whatever voice un, unzipped and the the reality of all this is that some of the stuff you know, is not all that far fetched, you know, because there was Nazi doxers, you know, like Mengele, you know, you know, sewing on, you know, different parts to people. I mean, doing just really atrocious, you know, nasty shit. And then, you know, these guys, you know, they, after the war, they, you know, goose stepped their chicken shit asses down to Argentina, you know, and then lived the rest of their lives out without paying for it. But, yeah, to me, that's probably, you know, that's what makes it even scarier because it's not really all that far-fetched. You know, a super elixir for a super soldier, okay, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But the experiments, probably some of that stuff, you know, did happen. 
I, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to read that they were based on actual things. That that would not be shocking in the slightest. Yeah. That is the true most horrific moment there is when he's first in the underground part and discovering all these things like the the talking head attached to the spinal cord, which is a very cool and creepy image. Um, so most of that. But it feels like by the time we get to all of that stuff again in the third act, it felt like actually more superhero y movie to me than mm-hmm. than horror, which is fine. Um again, I'm not I'm not taking anything away from this movie because I hadn't said it yet, but I loved this movie as well. Um it was a really good movie and it's definitely one I would rewatch. And one of the things that makes this movie so good is like all the you know, all the war stuff is so intense and that opening scene you feel like you're on that plane, which just mm. creates yeah. such an anxiety anxiety in you. But um, but just the the characters and getting to know these characters and their relationships with each other and and to me I don't know why I don't watch more war movies because that's what I like to see in a good war movie and that's usually what I get when I see a good war movie is like you know always this little troop of 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 soldiers who's the you know the cards are against them and they have to overcome and they're such a diverse ragtag team of uh, of misfits most of the time and. And that's what you get in this one, and I I really liked all the characters so much so that like you know you think when one of them is gonna get it, you know it really really affects you. Like uh, when he when when um um I forget his name, but Doogie Howser's uh, best friend Vinny uh, <laughs> goes to save that little boy, and the whole time, and I look at Brandy, I'm like, he's gonna get shot, he's gonna get shot doing this, and sure yeah, enough, he does, and I'm, and we're just like. And I don't think we let, I don't think we breathed again until we knew he was okay. Uh-huh. <clears throat> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that's a solid across the board thumbs up from everybody. When his yeah, head think- flips off backwards, yeah, and oh. those bones. <laughs> That's the, the collarbones and shit break up. To, oh my god! Starts going like John Carpenter's the thing. Jesus yeah. Christ! Yes. <laughs> when awesome. the guy gets shot yeah, that, in the face, that, that caught me. That caught me off guard the first time when when they, when they when he first did that, I was like, yeah, mm. holy moly! Yeah, that. Uh, you kind of. I mean, I hit. knew that he would. He was. He was gonna be like some kind of like invincible like super freak or something, but yeah, I didn't expect him <laughs> to like flip his head. Over or backwards like a can opener or something. Oh man! <laughs> yeah, it went, yeah, he turned himself into a Pez dispenser, essentially. <laughs> you know, like, uh, but you kind of get a hint as like the, the, something's rotten in Denmark when he takes that canteen and like you know crushes it like a pop can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good move. Or he downs the whole thing in one gulp. <laughs> yeah, I'm thirsty. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So. Great. Andy, what's our next movie? Our next movie comes from 2020, and it is Ghosts of War. The outpost is 30 miles over those hills. Let's move out. Who are we babysitting this time? Not a who. A mansion. Yowza, yowza, yowza. Speaking of my whole neighborhood in Queens. It's supposed to be a big deal when the 82nd Airborne came through and pushed out the Nazi high command. This is a life question. You hear that? We need to talk. We stay here from are fish in a barrel. We're staying. What's that? I found it in the basement. It belonged to one of the Nazis who took over the house. It says but a fam lived here. This ain't right, man. This place is bad, Juju. I'm just gonna say what we're all thinking. This place is haunted. Everything we experience, it's what the Nazis did to the family that lived here. Let's get out of this house. If you leave, They're here. I want everyone geared up and ready to clear out. Let's 
can't leave. It won't let us leave. This isn't real. 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 real. Andy, before you start, I just want to say one thing real quick. Um, that this is this movie here is the reason why we're doing this episode. I saw this for tw- for our 20, 2020 end year, and I was the only one in the crew that watched it. And the whole time, when I finished watching this the first time, the whole time I'm thinking, man, I hope the other guys watch this because I've got to get <laughs> some more opinions on this movie. And so you guys didn't, so I'm like, screw it. I'm going to make you guys watch it for an episode. <laughs> but go ahead and take it away, Andy. Um, okay, the dirty half dozen meets Amityville horror. <laughs> um, yeah, this was uh, this actually really kind of pleasantly surprised me. Um, it's a obviously a war movie, but it's got a little bit of a twist that I just I don't really want to tell because I think other people sh- should watch it. But see, normally when they they give it's kind of like a tired old technique this m night Shyamalan fucking uh bruce willis is a ghost type bullshit that just makes me want to hit somebody with a brick every time they do it in a movie um but this was this twist was crafted enough at least from my perspective that it just it didn't aggravate me um i just i thought it was i thought it was unique enough that it just it didn't seem you know cheap to me um basically um and i'll finally get into what the hell this thing's about um it's basically you've got five uh battle-worn um allied soldiers and they're guarding this french chateau that was previously occupied by the nazis and they start experiencing unexplained and terrifying you know just supernatural ghost-like stuff and they need to hold it there. Uh, they need to stay there until their relief takes over. Um, when they get there, uh, all these other soldiers, they're ready. They're ready to clear out. There's just like, we do not want to be here. You know, here, take our, you know, our, our comm link or whatever the hell that backpack thing is, uh, you know, to order in, you know, other military stuff. I'm sorry. Um, but it's this once they get there just a lot of crazy shit happens but uh i i do like the characters i mean uh they're similar to like you know our guys in overlord they've got good rapport you know they 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 have this you know this really tight unit that you know look out for each other um and they're, of course, you know, they're engaging in Nazis before they get there. The the scene with the Jeep, I really love that, you know, because they, they set up a landmine and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, they get into fistfights with Billy Zane, which is which is <laughs> sweet. And then they shoot him in the head, which was unexpected. <laughs> um, but all this all this stuff that happens uh, in the house, you know, just, you know, uh, some of it is a little bit, uh, tropey when it comes, you know, Ooh, I found a diary. Um, but you know, they do need a mechanism to, you know, to help them, you know, figure out what, what the hell's, you know, going on. It's got a lot of good jump scares in it that I think like when, uh, uh, Tappert, uh, Kyle Gallner, um, you may remember him from the remake of Nightmare on Elm Street, and I think I saw him in a little bit of The Walking Dead. But uh, he's also in The Cleansing Hour. If you guys haven't seen that, oh, yeah. Um, when that's when he's looking through his scope and everything's calm, and you know you got you got all that jump scares. There's there's a scene in the library where the soldiers are just fighting off all the ghosts that are just that's just crazy. Um. And some of the stories that, uh, and even when nothing's happening, the soldiers just, uh, you know, they're relaying all these stories about, you know, they look underneath the stamp and it says they, you know, they cut out my tongue. And uh, the cat's cradle story about Tappert and him going ape shit. Of course, you kind of get a, you kind of get an idea of what Tappert's like, you know, when he kills the Nazi. 
and he cuts out his gold molars and he's collecting all these, you know, these gold teeth from these, these Nazis and stuff like that. But, uh, um, I'll let you guys talk about other points in the, in the movie, but so I, I, I dig this, uh, this, this whole storyline. Um, uh, let's hear from, hear from somebody else. Well, you, you brought up what they did to the Nazis at the Jeep and he, you know, pulled out the teeth and, and took the coats and stuff. And like, it comes off as an extremely, extremely cruel yeah. and inhumane thing to do. But then he turn, turns that around when they find the uh, the you know refugees trying to escape, and he gives the coat and the and the gold to this woman and and yeah. and his child and her child. The concentration <clears throat> camp people. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and so I, I I thought that was a really cool. You know, both those scenes are really cool character moments for him, his character in particular. That you know, on the surface he is this like insane man with you know no remorse for what he's doing and just and cruel as hell but deep down he's got like a real sense of humanity to him i also uh since i usually do the line of the film actually it's tappard who has the line of the film for me um he's got two really great moments but his line of the film if we're dead heaven fucking sucks <laughs> <laughs> and um when he's asking him, uh, he's asking Eugene about the book and he's going into this and Eugene goes into this long diatribe about, you know, blah, 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 crab nebula, all this and all this other horse shit. And then Tapper just looks at him. And he just goes, you could have just said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had some of the best. Uh, he was my favorite character in this movie. Uh, yeah. Mine too. Far, and I loved his mustache. Yeah, this movie is pretty great. I I liked it a lot. I thought it was, um, yeah, all the things Andy said. I'm not necessarily ever a big fan of ghost movies, but, you know, it's fun to follow these guys. They were great. And, and what a amazing set to make a movie in, right? This house that is house incredible. Is gorgeous. I loved it. As far as, like, haunted house movies go, this has got to be one oh. of my favorite houses in a haunted house movie of all time. For real. And... That's- yeah, so you know, I don't, I know Michael want to spoil it, so but I won't. Yeah, the thing is, you can't but, talk about it too much, is because you'll you'll give a, a little bit too much away. Well, we, we're gonna have to figure out a way of tiptoeing around it because it's a big chunk of the reason why I wanted to talk about it. Mm-hmm. I was just, I wanted to say, well, I can reference it. I just don't, I won't say it. But so obviously, in in the third act of this movie, it takes an incredible uh, change. Uh, it goes in a different direction of it's a whole different kind of movie than we just spent the hour, the last hour and a half in. And I was going to say, I, 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 I liked the war movie part on its own. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I thought that was yeah. great. And it's not that I, you know, I, I, I also really like the ending. I just, I just wanted to compliment the first part of the movie was great too. So like, mm-hmm. um, but it's such a, it was such a, shocking change when they when it changes it's such a change unlike most any movie yeah, anywhere it's, it's a hairpin turn oh really. my god yeah. it just turns into a different movie it literally turns into a different movie <laughs> like even genre i would say oh absolutely and yeah but it's it's jolting at first and it takes a minute to figure out what the hell's going on or why but uh, like Andy said, first thing, like it made me like the writing of the whole thing because it was, I thought they explained it really well and why it was happening and all the was, clues are there. All yeah. the clues are there. It was very interesting. The writing it's, of how they pulled that off. It's a, th- that's just the thing. It's like, it's a movie that I feel like you need to watch a second time yeah. In order to in order to find more things within the first part of the film that will reference what you'll then you'll get like what they're referencing later. And it's it's yeah, it's it's kind of like a total recall. Like when I first saw Total Recall, I liked it, but I was just like, oh, wait a minute, is I need to uh I need to go back and, you know, watch. Of course I was ten, but um <laughs> 
I need to go back and you know and rewatch it, and then I'll understand it a little bit better. But um, yeah, there's and there's a great scene where a German soldier looks like he's drowning, and I think Theo Rossi he, he just kind of he's kind of stands there. And he's like, and like this invisible force is holding him down in the water, and you hear like these girls giggling, and I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> And yeah, a lot, a lot of great stuff. A lot of great stuff in this. The getting back to the to the uh, the ending, um, it, and I think that would also help with a second viewing as well because it it is extremely jolting when it happens because it mm-hmm. it takes a huge, huge, huge turn. And so I'm first watching this, and I don't know what to think by the end because. Because it, it, it doesn't end, the movie is a different movie by the end. And I was so invested yeah. in what I thought the movie was right. up to that point. And I think we've all been there where we've sat down to watch a movie or go see a movie at the theater or whatever with an, with one expectation what this movie's going to be, and it turns out to be something else. Not that that makes it a bad movie, but you know, it's like when you go to take a drink and you think you're drinking <laughs> soda and it turns out to be milk and that... And your brain is programmed for one taste, <laughs> and it makes the other taste seem so dang nasty because you weren't anticipating it. And I mean, and that's not really fair to the movie because or the milk <laughs> or the milk. Um, so I don't. I, I, and and I also am a believer that I don't think an ending should totally ruin a whole movie. I mean, you can listen to the first hundred episodes of this show when we talk about. Uh, High tension over and over again, um, and you can get those first hundred episodes now on on the website. Nice plug. You're welcome. <laughs> but it is a- but um, but oh, but it, it's so. I think maybe I even liked it better the second time. Um, but it's even still the second time. It's just still such a huge turn, even though I know it's coming. Yeah, it's 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 a cinematic. You know, it's a it's very sleight of hand. But I think you you've spent enough time, you know, getting invested in in the characters and and to what's going on. It's just like you can't help but say, okay. But, where are we going now? I really need to find this out. But you that's know? kind of part of it too, because. They're not the characters we thought they were, technically. Which, in turn, you know, makes me pay more attention. I'm just like, okay, what the hell? You know, it's, uh, and you know, it's a horror movie, so you know, it's, 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 it's got some really weird supernatural tie-in, and yeah, I, I don't want to, don't want to spoil it. So. Yeah, and I, and I definitely wouldn't say it's a perfect movie without some flaws in that big change but it, like for me at the end of the day i'm like i thought it was the writing in the balls to to do something like that that made me like it yeah. overall i think it's it's just it's it's different oh yeah so counterpoint yeah yeah I, counterpoint I, I don't like the ending i it take it took it completely takes me out of it um for the first two thirds of this before that uh, this is my favorite of the three actually um, everything about this works Good. for me. All the ghost action worked. I love the war elements. I love the action. The build up, the mystery, all the different clues coming together. To me, wow. this was actually, I like this more than Overlord to an extent. Yeah. Um, all of that worked for me. Um, I, I'm not a fan of the ending. I agree. It takes such a drastic turn. <sighs> I'm not entirely sure where it came from to where, uh, like you said, I'm trying not to spoil it, but yeah, uh, I, I'm trying to see where, where the idea came from in the storyline sense. They mention they mentioned where it, you know, what they're trying to do and what it's trying to accomplish, but I don't see it. I don't see the rationale for how the ending comes in, and uh, it's really killing me not to go deeper into spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're actually selling it more now. So. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say I agreed with Jason in that I appreciate – 
um, the risks that they took. And I am not a war movie guy and I am not a ghost movie guy. And combining the two um, <laughs> was not my thing, but I appreciate it for what it is. It's cool to see Skylar Aston in a movie where he's not like a pretty boy or a douchebag singing because uh, he's just sort of like he's like the pitch perfect guy. And it's like. I don't know. Just seeing him outside of that role was nice because I think he's actually a pretty decent actor. But I also have to agree with Don that the twist took me out of the movie and it's just sort of I don't know. I just jump scares and stuff like it just it, it hit on a lot of things I don't love in movies, uh, but I can appreciate what they were trying to do. It's just not my thing. For me, I mean, I'm also in agreement that the first half of the movie, I, I freaking loved it, and this and this is why it made the whole, you know, the, the second half left me so complex. But because I am a, I'm a, you know, I'm a comic book fan, big comic book fan, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a guy who became a comic book fan as a child in the uh, in the seventies. So I remember reading a lot of like war comics, like GI combat, uh, Sergeant rock and his easy company. Um, and then a lot of horror comics too, like house of mystery and this movie, I mean, and it even had visual elements of it throughout the movie and both the war stuff and the horror stuff that just read comic book to me that come off as a comic booky to me. So this totally invoked, those memories of reading those war comics without actually having to do any reading. So that was great. Um, so when the, when the twist happens, I, I was like, ah, oh, cause I was so loving what I was getting up to that point. But again, it's not, you know, it's not, not a bad twist. I think I thought, I mean, I totally get how it could take you out. Cause it does take you out. Cause that literally does. It literally does. does. <laughs> And it's not that it undoes everything that you just yeah. saw, you know, I mean, it, but, you know, I get right. it. Right. I mean, for me, well, I mean, for me, it's like what I said, there's one line in the, and there's one line in all of the dialogue that just kind of throws me in. It's about the intent behind what they're trying to do. And trying to apply that to what, happens in the rest of the movie that uh, to me i just i don't see any kind of a connection yeah no i think i know what you, i think i may know exactly mm. what line you're talking about um because i think it feels like the dialogue is a little forced yeah in that moment. i mean and i you think know, it's probably because we have a whole other movie going on that we're only getting you know like 10 minutes of so i feel like maybe you know there was some over exposition right. in a matter of two minutes kind of thing. Right. Um, I, there's other films that I've done that as well. So it's not just this. Um, in theory, I don't mind the idea of what's going on. Um, I've actually, ex I've actually liked other films that have done this in the past, but yeah, there's just one line about what everything, about what, what they're trying to do and how the twist comes into play it just it doesn't really settle for me and that's uh, to me that's the one issue that bogs this down for me because otherwise i actually like this more than over yeah i mean both so. these movies the the world war ii stuff is so solid mm -hmm. that you don't even need the rest of the horror stuff to still come out yeah. with a great movie so but i just this next part mm -hmm. that i'm going to bring up is going to be super tough but I just I want to know thoughts on the very 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 end of the movie, because it felt extremely abrupt. To I mm. I came to one of one of a couple one of a couple conclusions that yeah one is this a part one to a two part story we're supposed to get because that's how it felt or two is this an endless loop endless loop oh is that how you took it absolutely oh, okay. I took I can loop. I can I I can. I can be happy with that. Yeah. yeah. To me, it was a loop. Okay, cool, cool. Then it makes, then. Because he literally wakes up. Yeah, that's, the where, exact I, that's where I came from. Therefore, starting the movie over again. Great, right. cool. And I wasn't sure, literally, even after yeah. watching it twice now, I wasn't sure if he said that in the beginning or not. Yep. Verbatim. Okay, cool. Yep. I'm Then I'm fine with that. That's great. I like that answer. Which makes the 
abrupt. Um, the well, which makes the curse of you know a real thing. Yeah, you know. So yeah. even though it's weird, but yeah. And I think now I'm glad everybody's on that page. Well, Tad, did you think that too? Because I didn't hear from you on that one. Did you think that too? Or? Yeah, that's that's what I the conclusion I drew. Also, okay, okay, great. Then I think I went from being. Where the very end of the movie, I didn't like to being like, I think that might be my favorite part now. Yeah. <laughs> just because like, I just, I love that idea of just, yeah. this is now an mm. infinite movie. Yep. It's definitely, uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm shocked that you watched it in the first place. I don't know if I don't you would have picked it if it wasn't on the yeah, 20. Probably not. Probably wouldn't have picked it if it wasn't oh, on the It's cool 20 that 20. you did, and it's definitely a movie that gets you talking. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think at the end of the day, that's, I think, the biggest victory for me in this movie is that it definitely invoked some conversation. In a year or so, we'll finally talk about the ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody go see it so we can talk about the ending. <laughs> yeah, it's on Netflix. Right. Okay, so Jason, what's the last movie of discussion? Oh my gosh, it's one of the coolest movies ever. It's yeah, from You're welcome for getting to talk. Uh-huh, getting it's from 2006. Me. Guillermo del Toro's masterpiece, Pan's Labyrinth. In a dark time when hope was bleak. There lived a young girl whose only escape was in a legend that wanted her back. The legend speaks of the lost soul of a princess from another world who will one day be reborn. There will be signs that mark her return. There will be secrets that reveal her destiny. Oh man, I don't even have to say anything. The trailer said it all for me. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Let's go with. It's 1944, and the Allies have invaded Nazi held Europe. In Spain, a troop of soldiers are sent to a remote forest to flush out the rebels. They are led by Captain Vidal, a murdering sadist, and with him are his new wife, Carmen, and her daughter from a previous marriage, 11 year old Ophelia. Ophelia witnesses her stepfather's sadistic brutality and is drawn into Pan's Labyrinth, a magical world of mythical beings. Oh, what a great movie. You're almost a man. <laughs> and is that but, all you got? I, well, I, yeah, it's awesome. Where do you go? I mean, it's got, 
I mean, the, the, the monsters, the, the pale man's like my favorite monster of all time. He's so gosh dang good. Creepy as F. And Fawn, and they're both played by Doug Jones, the greatest. And um, it's just so great. I, I don't know where to. I can't believe this is Don's first time. Yeah. Um, nobody had actually sold it on, sold me on it being mm. a horror film. So it just kind of slipped through the cracks. <laughs> so yeah. Um, if you want Good. my first time thoughts, I cannot call this a horror film. I can call this expertly crafted, beautiful, imaginative, and absolutely enthralling. I wanted more sure. time in the in the underworld. I wanted more time there. To me, this is actually the one where that element works, whereas the war elements I are see distracting. That. A lot of a lot of that stuff, I I just I don't find it interesting. Uh, you know, the soldiers trying to stay in command on their outposts and trying to assert their authority by just bullying and beating everybody that dares to speak out against them. Uh, I mean, it's fine, but I just I I want more than that. You know, like that's like like that's uh, that's a perfect starter thing to you know get me on board and thinking that they're absolute jerk offs, but. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I would really want more. I would really want, I would want it integrated better because it, it feels like they're just two totally separate universes and there's like no real connection between the two. Like the only time we really get them is that one shot at the end where, you know, Ophelia takes the baby and wanders off into the woods. Like that's really the only time that they ever really connect. Like I, I really would have wanted more to come about from the two setups but I, I have nothing to complain about. You know, it, it's Del Toro at the height of his powers. Uh, you know, like I said, just enthralling to watch. Oh, the creativity yeah. of the creatures is just yeah. absolutely spectac spellbinding. I mean, you know, the two cre you know, the two main creatures we meet. You know, that fawn minotaur kind of a thing, and then you know that eyeless demon. Uh, just absolutely beautiful to look at. So much love for practical effects and makeup. You know, Doug Jones, need I say more? Um, yeah, just I I really would have wanted more of a connection between the two. Maybe bring it, maybe bring everything together just a little bit more cohesively instead of just having setups in two, set, in two different universes and two different worlds. But that's my only real complaint on this. I... I loved it. I could, I see where you're coming from on it, but I feel like if we got any more, when I think one of the things that makes this movie work so well for me is that it leaves me at the end wondering, is that real or was that all in, all in just the girl's head? That and was I, always yeah. the feeling. Yeah, and it's executed so well that that, that it leaves you um, wondering that at the end. And, and I kind of don't want to know the right answer. Right, it keeps it as a fairy tale and not real. But was it real? But was it? Yeah. There were moments in this film that the girl just really kind of pissed me off. To tell you <laughs> <laughs> when she took go. the food off the table, of course. Well, when she took the t food off the table, <laughs> I was like half tempted, just like, okay. She keeps swatting away these things that are trying to save her who end up getting killed uh -huh. because of her. And I was just half tempted. I was just like, Doug, eat this bitch. <laughs> I mean, she had one. You have one fucking rule to follow. One exactly. Rule. Don't do it. I, I mean, I know she like, sucks, but grapes. Really, you're gonna risk it for grapes? You're gonna risk your life and kill two other living things for fucking grapes? Doug, eat this <laughs> bitch. <Little> dipshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that should be on the video uh, cover. Yeah. <laughs> Andy Wassum, AOTV. <laughs> <laughs> Inside my Doug, eat this oh, bitch. <laughs> but I love, uh, like, I said, greatest tagline uh -huh. to sell a movie ever. <laughs> I, I did really enjoy the the effects, you know, like, you know, the guy, you know, 
getting sliced through the cheek and then he's got to sew it up and then like an idiot he takes a drink and you see like the wo- the the wound just flood with all that booze and just uh yeah the the effects were great and um it seems like del toro has a moment like that in all of his films some super visceral body horror puncture yeah, yeah there's that like mirror scene in uh crimson peak like the bathroom scene does get a the sink. sword in the armpit in his first movie um oh man I mean, yeah. this is. I mean, I. I wouldn't almost. I. I, I agree with Don. I don't think this is necessarily uh, horror. I think it falls into that sort of Ridley Scott uh, legend kind of area for me. Uh, but other. Uh, but it's still. I know where you guys are coming from, but man, the Pale Man is freaking terrifying. Okay, well, you you can still have horrifying elements in fantasy. You you know you can't just automatically say you can't be terrified of just horror elements only. You know, yes, I I do agree that you know they are nightmarish in their concept, but I can still totally buy somebody being completely terrified of you know something outside of the genre. I mean, I know personally somebody who is scared shitless of ET. <laughs> Well, about the brutality of the main bad guy oh, yeah. and so much gore and death and murder and hey, yeah, but I'm one of those. War. I don't find that to be just sp- to be sp- to complete qualifications to include something. I'm one of those that I don't find gore to be just like a deciding factor in genre classification. Yeah. No, it's more fantasy. But yeah, yeah. I think it was a. Fun stretch for Mike to put it in there because this is still terrible. Oh, yeah. Still well, the way Andy was speaking, movie, is this you know? your first time seeing this? Me? Uh, well, it's the second time I've seen it. I think I saw okay. it like maybe in 09, I think. I mean, I own it. I watched it once and I probably was mad that the girl girl didn't get eating, so I just put it back on the shelf. <laughs> but I knew what I watched was, was pretty amazing. Just It was great <laughs> filmmaking. Yeah, so. this is one of like the handful of films I feel like I have to own in 4K because it's just so gorgeous. Um, another one of those that you'd put on the TV to like test your equipment because it's just visually you could watch this on mute and it's gorgeous. But, you know, then the story itself, uh, there's so many sad, dark moments in this movie. Yeah. You just feel I, I felt for the girl the entire time. I mean, I didn't want it to get her eaten because uh, she <laughs> lives a shit life and uh, things keep getting worse for her. And I guess uh, it sort of reflects on the fact that um, she's living in such poor conditions that a grape would uh, be willing. She'd be willing to risk her life for a grape because um, what she dies and have to go back to that asshole living um in a world that she hates. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You know, it's like, she doesn't even really seem that scared of the pale man, to be honest, when she's down there. Um, doesn't really, she doesn't really have a lot of fear with anything. She's not like, you know, she doesn't like recoil even at all when that giant toad, you know, Oh yeah. Tongue against her face. And she's like, well, well, Okay. Well, I mean, look at her life, though. I mean, she's being brought up. Her her dad's dead, and she's being forced to call the uh, captain, her father, like living in a war torn country. You know, right? Her life sucks, and her mom. I feel for her mom. Her life sucks. Uh, you just mm-hmm. absolutely fucking hate that guy with every bit of my being. Um, I just the entire time just want him dead, and. Uh, when he finally gets his cheek slashed, that out, you know, and he, he ends up. Uh, just you feel for the doctor. There's just so many. It's very emotional. Like I, I've really had uh, a lot of emotions watching this one. I, I and of course this isn't my first time, but it still uh, hits me in the feels watching it again. I think the the mm-hmm. the most most painful thing to the to the captain wasn't the cheek slice. It wasn't getting shot in the face. It was said. It was what was said right before, and that was like the victory moment for me when the woman's like. This child's not even going to know who you are. Fuck yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he was a... He, he, they made a good heavy in this. That's oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, seeing this again, I was like... 
God damn it! Now I have to go buy the NECA figures because they've made the the fawn. Oh, they have. They've made oh, and they've wow. made two fawns. They've made two oh, fawns. They're awesome. The fawn and then the old fawn, and then they made Pale Man, and then they made uh, what's their girl's name? They made her. So, uh, and they're gorgeous. They're perfect. And now I will be spending probably one hundred and fifty dollars buying all of them, but they're so cool. <laughs> they're they're very Jason cool. and I went to that Del Toro exhibit up in. Yep, oh, not with you too. guys, but I went also. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and that was freaking amazing. Uh-huh. And yeah, just seeing that big pale man life size statue was kind of hard to even want to look at it because it was even terrifying just standing there, knowing it's a statue. But um, yeah, his skinny little legs and like the flaps that hang out by his like crotch. Yeah, that's the stuff that's nightmare feel more so than the eyes and the hands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The fawn was there too, and just incredible the amount of detail. It's See, and that's that's where I get you know pissed off at like certain CGI creatures. It's not isn't necessarily for the fact that they're CGI creatures, but the design work isn't is as detailed and thought out, and doesn't seem like there's enough care put into it as say something like this. Oh. Hmm. <clears throat> But uh, that's it, folks. That is our topic of World War II horror. Uh, There's still more show to come. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will have segments. It'll be the segments portion of the show. Um, But you know, before uh, before we get in segments, you're going to hear about our podcast network, the podcast network that we did all by ourselves, called the Prescribed Films Podcast Network. Dozens of shows. On the network of all shapes and shapes and sizes. And you can check them out at the P, the PFPN.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. It is time for segments here on Attack of the Killer Podcast. Let's kick it over to Jason with shout outs. It's time for shout outs. Shout outs. Shout outs. Shout outs. Shout outs. All right. Everyone's favorite segment. We asked, what are your favorite World War II based horror movies? And a lot of great fun responses. Up first on our Facebook page, we got Benjamin Chi. He says, Shockwaves, one of the first WW2 Nazi zombie genre films, although the movie itself was set in the 70s. And also Pan's Labyrinth, which is set in Francoist Spain, 1944. Shockwaves. Shockwaves, woo! Up next, we got Don and Nelly. He said, hey, wait a minute. Woo! He's, and that's what he says. He says, um, well, there's, oh, wait a second. He was here to tell us. <laughs> so sneaky, that Don and Nelly. <laughs> uh. hey, then we got Tim Walker. He says, he says, Overlord, The Bunker from 2001, and Shockwaves. Nice. A lot of love for Shockwaves. That's great. Yeah. Then we got Jason Zbornick. He says, don't even think I have one. What is there besides Dead Snow? And I don't like that film. Oh, no, Dead Snow 2. Yeah, way better, in my opinion. Um, we covered three of them. You can uh, listen to our show and cover it. That's yeah, true. Yeah, Jason, we listen to the dang show. <laughs> Pretty good ones. <laughs> and then uh, we got our pal, the Reebster, Mike Reeb. Woo! He says, oh, it's a good one, too. He says, Frankenstein's army is fucking epic. Yeah. I know it's a bit past WW2, but... Zombie Lake is about Nazi zombies from the war. Ooh, Zombie yeah. Lake. He went with oh, Zombie Lake. I haven't watched that in a while. Yeah, yeah me too. Uh, I haven't watched that in a while. Now that Pornhub's gone, maybe it's time to bust that out. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, and because I don't have many, the 
Return to Castle Wolfenstein Xbox game. <laughs> nice. Yeah, well, I always thought that uh, Overlord was kind of a Wolfenstein-inspired right. type movie. Anyway, over on the group edition, our group on Facebook, we got Jacob McLaughlin. He says, I thought the recent film Overlord was a lot of fun. It's Saving Private Ryan meets Reanimator, and it works. That's pretty good. Hey, we got our pal Izzy Sutton. Izzy says, Nice, Izzy, what's up? Overlord was cool. Really dug Frankenstein's army and the bunker and below as well. Oh, don't know that one. Below. Then we got attacker Brett Royer. He says, Dead Snow was pretty good. Still haven't seen the sequel. It's way better. And he says, <laughs> I'm lobbying for <laughs> Apparently. a Nazi movie. Anyway, uh, Overlord was awesome. Below is super underrated. A submarine horror flick written by Darren Aronofsky and with Zach Galifianakis in it. What? Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to watch this now. I know. Gosh dang. How we- uh, it, it's kind of borderline. It's even less of a horror than Pan's Labyrinth is. But written uh, by Darren I, I have a hard time... Co- yeah, fuck that guy. Oh. Oh, oh we'll have you back for the Darren Ar- Aronofsky <laughs> episode. <laughs> I got to find out what's going on there. Is that Galifianakis? You got to love it. He's so great. He also, uh, Brad also says, also, I don't think Iron Sky technically counts since it doesn't really take place in WW2 and isn't really horror, but it's close enough for me and it's so much ridiculous fun. It was pretty crazy fun. I like that one. We got Tim Lenerer. He says, I really liked Below because there's an ordinary, we're stuck in the metal tube where we could die at any second stress. And then the supernatural problems getting stacked on top of the existing ones. Also a moment where I saw where things were going just in time to feel even more dread than usual. Because at that point, the characters are helplessly moving towards their doom. And the viewer is forced to watch as fate comes crashing down. All right, we'll watch it. Gosh. <laughs> and then we got our pal, Brian Clark. He says, I'm quite fond of Jess Franco's Oasis of the Zombies. Of course, of course, you know, Brian of course Clark. Brian's got a f- <laughs> Jess Franco. He's, yep. He says it's made with all the usual professionalism and attention to detail one comes to expect from Franco. <laughs> but it does manage. Absolutely does. <laughs> but it does manage to uh, ring some creepy atmosphere out of its Desert location and the simple but effective zombie makeup. I'm gonna probably skip that, but it, Michael, it's not a bad movie. I just I like the Spanish cut of that movie a lot more. It's almost impossible to track down, and I am so lucky I found a copy. The Spanish version of that film is a lot better. Uh, for those that don't know, the version that most people see as Oasis of the Living Dead is the French cut of the film. It's not the Spanish cut. The The f- Spanish cut's a little different. It, there's uh, three or four scenes that are changed around in the running order, and several scenes are taken out and replaced with new footage. Uh, the new footage is actually far creepier and far more chilling than what's on screen in the French cut. Nice. Uh, it, there's a... It, I don't know why the Spanish cut is as hard to find as it is. Um, I found a bootleg copy years ago, and it's miles better than Oasis, so I have no idea why it's hard to find. But if you can find it, the Spanish cut, I think they titled it uh, Tombs of the Dead or something. Um, if you can find it, the Spanish cut is far better than the than the French cut, which is out there. And the French cut is the one that everybody's more familiar with because it's the one that's in circulation. Good to know. And uh, we didn't have any shout-outs on Twitter, but we had one on Instagram. And first-time commenter is Spooky Dudes Podcast. Says, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say The Prowler. The beginning of the film takes place during WW2. Just a brutal Joe Zito slasher with amazing makeup effects from Tom Savini. It's a bit slow in places, but it's just a great mean-spirited 80s slasher flick, and it came out when the 
in the theaters on the same day I was born. Keep on rocking, AOTKP. You keep on rocking, too. Spooky Dudes Podcast. And so that's all we got for shout outs. Um, remember, anyone can leave us a voicemail and we'll put that on the show. We can hear your voice on the show. And you can do that by calling us at 415 952 6857 or 415 95 AOTKP. And that's shout outs. Our next segment is the newest one to the show and it is quickly climbing the charts. Oh. People seem to really like it when we have guests, uh, guest stars on the show. So without any further ado, it's time for Reenactments with Christian Slater. Greetings and salutations, and welcome to another episode of Recasting with Christian Slater. And against your better judgment, you're still listening. But let me tell you, we've got a killer show for you tonight as we recast a scene from Rob Zombie's The Devil's Rejects. Playing the role of Charlie Altamont, who recently has taken out a restraining order on Gary Busey, direct from Snake Mountain and Attorney, Eternia, excuse me, Skeletor. <laughs> Devils, rejects, yes, finally something evil. And Busey better be 500 feet away. You don't want to know what he tried to do to my eye sockets. <laughs> You're really just leaving it up to my imagination, aren't you there, Skelly? Next up, playing the role of Cleavon, everyone, another series regular, Don Knotts, everybody. Hi! Can we make this quick? I got a candle commercial to do with Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> eh, well, chances are you're going to be smelling it from across the room, and I'm not talking about the candle. Last but not least, playing the role of Daryl is Academy Award nominee Christopher Walken. Thank you, uh, Christian. I just want to say, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. I listen to all of them. Both of them. Wow. I'll be sure to let you know when we do Radio City Music Hall. Ah, shit, let's get going. <clears throat> Exterior, farmstead, day. Charlie and Cleavon exit his convertible. Charlie groans as he stretches his back, a small cane in his hand. Oh, Lord have mercy. What a morning. Charlie and Cleavon begin walking toward a man, Daryl sitting on a ratty lawn chair next to multiple chicken cages containing various breeds. Daryl, a prototype hayseed, wears a flannel shirt with an undershirt two sizes too small. His large belly pokes out and lops over his jeans. Cleavon! Yeah, boss? You know why I come here to get these chickens? No, boss! Because my brother makes the best fried chicken in the world. Is that right? Charlie and Cleavon approach Daryl as he's picking his nose. Daryl stands. Chickens cluck and peck in their cages. Good morning, good morning, good morning, sir. How are you? How y'all doing? Good morning. Good, good, good. What you got for me? Daryl points at the chicken cages. Well, 
We've got these cute barrel rock chickens here. Yeah, I see it. Got them nice, long-legged Rhode Island red chickens. Rhode Island red! Yeah, those are some nice ones. Oh, I like them. Cleavon looks confused. I want a Rhode Island Red for me, all right? Two of them, yeah. Rhode Island Red, two. Yeah, yeah. Daryl looks down at the chickens, conflicted. Now, y'all ain't planning on fucking these chickens, are you? Charlie looks at Daryl dumbfounded. Moments pass until Charlie jabs his cane at Daryl. What the fuck are you getting at? Do you fuck chickens? Daryl chuckles for a moment. Well, I have thought about fucking me some chickens before. If you want a good, if you want to have a good time, and you need some pussy. You can cut that chicken's head off and stick your dick in the ass of that chicken. And that goddamn chicken will go crazy on your ass and go, ka. Cleavon looks off to the side, disgusted. Are you saying I would cut off a chicken's head, put my dick in it, fuck it, and go, ah? Are you accusing of me of fucking a chicken, motherfucker? Daryl recoils, nervous, puts his hands up. No, I ain't calling you a chicken fucker. But your boy over there looks sexually frustrated, and I don't approve a chicken fucking. <laughs> you hear what he called? You hear what he called me, boss? I ain't no chicken fucker. He called me a fucking chicken fucker. My mistake. Go back and grab the fucking chickens, Cleavon. Cleavon mutters, grabs the chicken cages, and begins to load them in the back of the convertible. Here, here's five. Charlie slaps a five-dollar bill in Daryl's hand. Appreciate it. Thank y'all. He's the chicken fucker! Cleavon places the last cage in the convertible. That's all right. Put it back there. Next time we go someplace else. Daryl shakes his head in disgust as, he dri as they drive off. <laughs> we ain't ever buying chickens from him again, boss! I know, I know. You inbred! Inbred! End scene. Thanks for tuning in to Recasting with Christian Slater. No animals were harmed during the production. And as always, we ask for the chicken's consent, because Don's a method actor. Stay tuned for Insane Mike's Hall of Fame or picks or whatever. <laughs>
Ray Dennis Steckler was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, where he had a love for movies starting at a very young age. By the time he was 15, he received an 8mm home movie camera from his stepfather, and the urge to make his own movies had begun. Ray served three years in the United States Army from 1956 to 1959. He was an Army photographer and served in Korea. Once discharged, Steckler and a, fr- and a friend drove to Hollywood, California to enter into the film industry. Steckler worked as a prop man before becoming assistant cameraman on the film World's Greatest Sinner, directed by and starring Timothy Carey. When the initial director of photography was fired, Steckler stepped up to replace him. Continuing to work in cinematography, Steckler acquired a union card and established himself at major studios, including Universal Studios themselves. The story goes that one day, Ray was fired for almost knocking an A-frame onto Alfred Hitchcock. After after that, Steckler turned his attention to the B-movie circuit. He began working with Arch Hall Sr. Uh, and his production company, Fairway Pictures. Steckler started as cinematographer and sometimes actor in films, including Arch Hall's, uh, the, Ar- the Arch Hall Sr. film that he made for his son, Arch Hall Jr., called Ega. After that, Steckler made his directorial debut in the Arch Hall Jr. vehicle, Wild Guitar. When Ray was recasted as the heavy at the last minute in Wild Guitar, he took on the screen name and thus cash flag Ray Dennis Steckler's acting persona was born. After working for Arch Hall, he began making his own films, and his first was the film that he is most well known for, The Incredibly Strange Creatures Who Stopped Living and Became Mixed Up Zombies. The film stars Cash Flag and his then wife Carolyn Brandt. Uh, filmed on a budget of thirty-eight thousand dollars, the film was photographed by cinematographer Joseph Mascalini, uh, with then newcomers, now Hollywood cinematog- cinematographer legends Laszlo Kovacs and Vilmos Zingmund. Hoping I'm somewhere close on that as first-time camera operators. Steckler took took creatures on the road himself and made it a success under a number of titles, including The Diabolical Dr. Voodoo and The Teenage Psycho Meets the Bloody Mary. Incredibly Strange Creatures is famous for its odd and extremely long title, but also is a self-proclaimed as the first ever monster musical. Steckler's next film in his... Uh, was his answer to Psycho, entitled The Thrill Killers, released in 1964. The film marked the first effort between Steckler and Ron Haydock. Ron would act, write songs, and even co-write several of the movies with Ray until Ron's death in 1977. During many midnight screenings of The Thrill Killers, um, Ray would have people dress up as the killer and run out with prop knives out to scare audience members. Ray Dennis Steckler continued to produce a number of low budget, but um, uh, a number of low budget films, which should, which sh- which soon attained cult status, including one of my favorites, Rat Fink a Boo Boo, which is a spoof on Batman. Uh, the movie stars starts out with hoodlums terrorizing an innocent woman, then becomes the story of our heroes Rat Fink and his sidekick Boo Boo as they are guests of honor in a parade. Eventually it comes back to the woman and the hoodlums at, as Rat Fink and Boo Boo take out the bad guys, but not before the woman is then kidnapped by Korg the gorilla, and then these mighty superheroes must end up freeing her from this monstrous gorilla. I love this movie because it is the most obvious example of Ray just kind of making it up as he goes along. It almost has my favorite. It it also has some of my favorite and actual funny lines in the movie, such as remember boo boo. We only have one weakness. What's that rat think bullets. The film was originally titled rat think and boo boo. But when the opening title sequence was being made, they accidentally left out the N and the D, so they just ended up changing the title of the movie to Rat Fink a Boo Boo. 
Ray Dennis Steckler's films often come off as amateurish, uh, but it really boiled down to him wanting to make his films his way. Ray would rarely work with a full script if he had any script at all. He also was notorious for hating to record sound, so many of his films were dubbed in post or would contain very little dialogue and mostly voiceovers or even no dialogue at all. Steckler would later go on to make low-budget softcore films throughout the late 70s and early 80s. And by the late 80s, Ray opened Mascot Video Store in Las, in Las Vegas. After going to Vegas myself many, many times over the years, I had planned to find the store only to learn that Ray had sold it in 1995. <sighs> Never got to see the videos. Uh, Ray continued to make films all the way up until 2009. Sadly, Ray passed away in January of 2009. Though never achieved any Hollywood success, don't know if Hollywood would know what to do with Ray, he achieved his own success getting to create his art the way he wanted. And that is why I induct Ray Dennis Steckler into this episode's Insane's Picks Hall of Fame. So that's it, folks. That concludes this episode of Attack of the Killer podcast. One more very special thanks to Don for joining us this episode. Don, woo! Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, guys. Always a pleasure to be here. Pleasure having you here, man. (laughs) Yeah, tell everybody again where they can find your business. Okay, so um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, um, I do have several podcasts. Uh, my main show is called is a uh, it's kind of an odd thing to say my main show but um it's my weekly show it's called No More Room in Hell presents Fresh Cuts which is a weekly look at the biggest release of the previous week so anything on streaming VOD uh sh- should be theatrical but um well you know how that goes at the moment uh basically it's uh you know, watch a movie, record it, get together, and go from there. Um, I, the running joke on the show with that one is that I'm not technically considered the host. Um, I'm the unofficial third co-host. <laughs> but um, it, it just basically stems from the fact that, um, you know, lockdown happened and I had nowhere else to go and nothing to do, so a group of friends were always like, you know, hey, we're doing this weekly, want to join in? And I was like, well, I've seen the movie, you know, I've got nothing else to do, might as well. And uh, it's been like that for going on a year now. So um, you can find that on uh, the Dark Discussions Podcast Network. Uh, be aware that there's a show, that there's two separate feeds. One is network, once is uh, the show specifically. Uh, you'll want the network one, which will have more shows on it. Be- other than- Otherwise, you'll just get Dark Discussions and not like dozens of other shows, um, including my other secondary show, which is uh, recently renamed the Graveyard Shit Podcast. That's the actual name. <laughs> uh, we used to be called Bay of Blood, but uh, we recently renamed ourselves Graveyard Shit. Uh, we just recorded our best of show um, a couple of days ago, so that should be out around the same time this is. So if you can hear uh, my choices for 2020 movies. You can uh, check that out. That's also on the Dark Discussions Network. Um, like I said before, you know, watch that you're getting the network show, not the specific feed for the for the Dark Discussion show. My third podcast is uh, sort of on. It's sort of touch and go. Um, basically, just whenever we can get together and record. That is called underwater kaiju from outer space Hmm. um as the title suggests we cover kaiju giant monsters ultraman you name it you know it's based on those kinds of features so if you want to check that out uh, you can find that on uh, the legion podcast feed yes i'm whoring myself out to various different (laughs) feeds and stuff but um yeah you can find that one on legion uh we're kind of a little little under the you know backtrack so it'll be a while to find our show that we're out there so um you can do that and you can check me out on my writing on various websites um i contribute to asian movie pulse 
which allows me to look at Asian horror cinema and all that good stuff. And my own personal site, which is donshorrorworld.blogspot.com. Wow, awesome. I thought we did a lot. I know, right? <laughs> look at that, Tad. We can no, have a third even... podcast. There we go. <laughs> well, thanks again for, for being on, Don. It's yeah, always man. a pleasure getting to hang out with you. You you do the Lord's work. We ap- always appreciate you're just the mad pimp on the internet and always mm-hmm. pimping the podcast, Absolutely. and we definitely love you for it. Absolutely. Absolutely, you guys. Um, I've said it on numerous shows, and I'll say it on here. Um, I only promote the stuff I enjoy, so Aww. Aww. that should speak what I think of your show. Thanks. Thank you. I got the feels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So with that said, thanks everybody out there for listening, and we'll talk to you on the next episode of Attack of the Killer Podcast. Oh no, could this be the end of? Wow!